Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Agile TD Mondays. This time with JB Reinsberger. Hello, JB. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. Before we start, I would like to let you know that you only have 14 days to submit your paper for the ninth edition of the Agile Testing Days. You can still send us your ideas or proposals until the 9th of April. And now let's move on. The stage is yours. All right, thanks very much. So uh, good afternoon to those of you in Europe and good morning to those of you in North America. Um, I'd like to talk today a little bit uh, about uh, something that's come out of the last uh, 10 years that I've been doing TDD training uh, around North America and Europe. One thing I've noticed is that although people generally hire me these days still to teach them something related to technical uh, program or technical skills, most of the stuff that I teach that really sticks, the stuff that people really remember, the stuff that people really find the most valuable, has almost nothing to do with programming and even nothing to do with technical skills for any role. And so I wanted to share a bunch of those things with you today. So this is just, as I've, as I've uh, said when I've done this talk a few times, an arbitrary selection of some underrated elements of the success for the modern programmer. But you could probably even take the word programmer out. If we have time, we might talk about a couple of programmery things. First, I'd like to start with uh, something that I think of as part of the center of the difference between traditional or waterfall thinking and agile thinking. And that has to do with managing risk. Now, if you're fans of the TV show Seinfeld, then you can remember the infamous risk management episode that sort of hinged on the joke that nobody understands what risk management really means. But uh, I think that any good software professional, any effective software professional needs to understand something about risk management. And so if you read a textbook on managing risk, one of the first things they'll show you is the idea that um, you can calculate the exposure of a project to failure by essentially enumerating a bunch of risks, figuring out the probability of the risk becoming a problem, figure out the cost to failure if that risk becomes a problem, and now you just do some arithmetic. You multiply the probability of the failure by the cost of failure, and you get sort of a, a figure that represents the average cost of that problem on that project. So if something has a 50% chance of happening and it would cost you 50,000 euro if it happened, then you kind of need 25,000 euro of insurance in order to deal with the cost of that failure. And so you could imagine that if you enumerated 20 risks on your project, then you could figure out the probability of failure, the cost of failure, multiply those things together, add it all together, and the total is $1.37 million. And that means that you need either $1.37 million in the bank or an insurance policy for $1.37 million, and you're sort of covering the risk of the project. Now, of course, we want to manage risk by reducing our exposure. But um, and in general terms, I think that humans have a tendency to, whenever they think about managing risk, they mostly think they have the impulse to think about lowering the probability of failure. They want to fail less. And so you could even say that waterfall philosophy is built on this idea. There's all kinds of stuff built into waterfall based on the idea of failing less often. Um, and they're, so by lowering the, prob the probability of failure, they lower the overall exposure, which means that they lower the sort of extra cost that comes from things going wrong in a project. Agile techniques instead focus on lowering the cost of failure. Remember, if exposure is the sum of the products of cost and probability of failure, then you could lower the probability of failure to lower your exposure, or you could lower the cost of failure. And like I said, humans have a tendency to focus on, immediately focus on lowering the probability of failure, whereas in agile techniques, we tend to worry, uh, we tend to focus more on lowering the cost of failure. It's as though we need to be reminded that lowering the cost of failure can be enough. And so we focus on things like frequent feedback, iteration, delivering incrementally, um, evolutionary design. Agile philosophy tends to focus on lowering the cost of failure by converging towards successful outcomes. This is what makes it different from what human nature might suggest. And so I recommend looking for ways to manage risk in your work 
your individual work, your project work, your company, by remembering that you could lower the cost of failure instead of always trying to figure out how to avoid making mistakes. And the key book here is a book called Waltzing with Bears, which has a wonderful chapter title that I love uh, called Risk Management is Project Management for Adults. Uh, the next thing that I want to talk about is somewhat related. It has to do with uh, more about how individuals work. And that has to do with, again, fighting human nature. It's human nature, I think, when we're working to try to carry all kinds of information in our head about what we're doing. Programmers experience this a lot when they get, for example, deep in a debugging session, or testers might do this when they're deep in an exploratory testing session, and they have all kinds of ideas in their head about what to do next, and then weird things happen, and they realize they need to fix something, and so they try to pause for a moment to do something and come back. Remember what it was it that I was doing 10 minutes ago before this micro-emergency came up? Or you get an interruption, and somebody asks you a question, so you have to shift contexts. I think we, we know by now that we need to work harder at dealing with this problem, that this constant context switching or this trying to keep everything in our head really slows us down. And this is where I recommend uh, taking seriously the idea of getting things out of your head. This is, as I said, it's especially important when you're working deep in a problem to avoid you becoming distracted or for, to avoid you sort of forgetting what you were doing at a moment when something comes up. Flow and speed come from focus. So this magical flow state that people talk about, that you've probably heard people talking about for years or even decades, flow comes not necessarily from spending a lot of time doing something, but from being able to focus on something. And so focus isn't just about efficiency. It isn't just about avoiding context switching. It's also about this wonderful thing that happens, this flow state that happens when you're allowed to focus on something. When I can focus on one task at a time, my work gets better. I make fewer mistakes and I recover from mistakes more quickly, which of course lowers the risk, lowers the cost of failure and the probability of failure both. It allows me to finish things sooner, which avoids, uh, which reduces the cost of delay and avoids creating bottlenecks where they don't need to exist. This comes as much from focus as from anything else. And one of the simplest ways that you can start improving your focus is by using the two-minute rule from uh, getting things done. Now, I don't want to turn this into a getting things done religious experience. I'm a fan of the ideas in getting things done. And some people have the false impression that getting things done helps you check things off a list better, that it's about, uh, it, it's about just, um, some people use the term plate clearing. It's about sort of finishing your food without thinking about what exactly you're eating. It's about being able to check things off a list without thinking about whether you should be doing that work at all. Nothing could be further from the truth. Getting things done helps in both ways. It helps both with managing the work that you do and on giving you time to explore whether you should be doing that work at all. If I have time, I'll come back to that in a moment. But the two-minute rule says that as, you know, the world is set up especially these days, to constantly interrupt us with requests for work. Um, email, phone calls, text messages, people showing up in your, uh, in your office, these are all ways for the world to ask you to do work and to interrupt you for the only purpose of asking you to do work. And this is where the two-minute rule becomes really helpful. It says this, when a request to work comes in, if you can do it immediately in two minutes, literally two minutes, not three minutes, not five minutes, but two minutes, then just do it and get it done. And you'd be surprised how quickly two minutes goes by. If you think you can do something in two minutes, I recommend setting a timer and watching how quickly two minutes runs out. But if you can get it done in two minutes, then don't do anything or don't try to plan it, don't try to prioritize it, don't try to do any of that stuff. As it comes in, if you think you can do it in two minutes, just get it done and get it out of your head. And if you can't finish it in two minutes, then you have to plan for it. And that's where you use the other steps of getting things done. Uh, do I have to do it at all? Can I give it to somebody else? Can I do it later? Let me put it in my backlog. Let me put it in my inbox and handle it the way I would handle all of my work. 
And so I recommend you can start using the two minute rule right now. It's especially good for dealing with the problem of getting into work, opening your email inbox, saying, oh, I'll just handle email really quickly, and then looking up and suddenly it's lunch and you haven't got any real work done. The two minute rule really helps with this. Once you've tried the two minute rule, then you might be interested in reading more about how to manage your work. And so I recommend, I have an article called Getting Started with Getting Things Done in case you want to read four pages instead of an entire book. I have a bunch of other articles on my blog. You'll, you'll be able to find links to those uh, after this presentation. As well as the books Getting Things Done, The Power of Full Engagement, and a little overlooked book that I really liked called Never Check Email in the Morning. And so these are things related to getting things done. And I found that we can take, uh, whether you use getting things done or some other technique for managing your work, I find that you can take those managing work techniques and your specific software work techniques like TDD, exploratory testing, deliberate discovery, that you can use these to complement each other. In fact, a lot of people find that they're in a position where they know that there are 12 excellent techniques that they could try, but they feel like they're so buried in a long backlog of work. They're so buried in stuff. People are yelling at them to get stuff done. They are way behind in commitments they've already made that they don't know how to get started even trying to learn this stuff. I mean, we, one of the things that the, the difficult things that we have to teach people is that learning costs money, time, and energy. That anytime you learn something, you have to go through a period where your productivity or your performance declines until it starts to go up again. That we have this, that's the so-called learning curve. And that scares a lot of people off. It makes them feel like they can never take the time to learn anything new because they can't afford to invest in the short-term uh, reduction in performance. And that's where getting things done can help. Because with getting things done, if I apply those techniques, that it helps me identify both the tasks that I shouldn't be bothered doing, and just maybe I can defer them or give them to someone else. Um, they help me streamline the time that I do spend getting work done. Fewer things fall through the cracks. I feel less stress while I'm doing work. These general work management techniques help me get more time and feel less stress. And I can use that more time and less stress, which also means more energy, to then devote more time to learning a specific um, technical skill that I want to develop, whether it's test-driven development, exploratory testing, deliberate discovery, any of those kinds of techniques that I want to use to make the software part of my work more effective. So if I spend some, if I invest energy in improving um, how I manage my overall work, then I have more time and less stress, which means more energy, to devote to learning these technical skills. And as I develop those technical skills and I do my technical work better, that also gives me more time and less stress and more energy that I can use to Im improve even more how I manage my work. And so we have this wonderful virtuous cycle where uh, getting things done, for example, getting things done, getting better at that helps me spend more time getting better at test-driven development, which helps me spend more time getting better at getting things done, which helps me spend more time getting better at test-driven development. And the cycle continues. And within months to a year, I uh, can find myself two, three, four times more effective at focusing on the work that I choose to do to get it done sooner and better and figuring out which work I shouldn't do at all and avoid doing it entirely. Remember that one of the central principles of agile software development, it's right in the manifesto, maximizing work not done. And techniques like getting things done or philosophies, let's say, like getting things done, help me really take that seriously. And so um, that's one of the reasons why learning how to manage my work more effectively helped me perhaps more than any of the technical skills that I learned. And the people that I teach have found the same thing. Routinely, when I talk to clients one year, two years later, the stuff that I've taught them out of getting things done, if they've taken it seriously and they've applied it diligently, that is perhaps the number one thing that provides effectiveness for them long term. It's the kind of thing that helps them 
figure out how, just generally how to have a higher capacity to do any work. And really, uh, building up our capacity to do work is probably the thing that will improve our, the single thing that will improve our performance more than anything else. Um, it'll allow us to learn how to do all those technical things better. Uh, it's a common denominator. And so, of course, the book Getting Things Done helps there. One of the other ones that I find really helpful um, is the book uh, Slack. Um, it really hammers home the value of having free time, money, and energy so that you can figure out how to improve things. And related to that, related to getting things done, is this notion that we think we need to carry these stuff in our head, and so it's really important to write things down. The, the old joke from the now 30 years old film Amadeus is it's no good to anyone in your head, Mozart, write it down. Um, especially young and especially male and especially programmers have this idea that being able to carry a bunch of things in their head is a sign of sort of, uh, I hate to say it, but you know, it's a, it's a sign of macho manliness. Um, I think that one of the things that happened to me as I got older and grayer and a bit wiser was that I recognized the limitations of my own brain. Uh, and I began to know, understand the wisdom of writing things down. You forget more than you think. It's no good to anyone else in your head. And it's easy to get distracted when you're trying to carry everything in your head. This is, again, one of the central ideas of getting things done and is, in general, a really uh, valuable thing to do. Whenever I'm working, whenever I'm doing anything, I have a piece of paper with me and I write stuff down. This is my inbox. This is a short-term inbox that allows me to write down ideas, thoughts um, as I'm working so that I can get them out of my head and focus on what I'm trying to do. And it, it achieves two goals. The first is it helps me avoid the situation where something important falls through the cracks. If I realize that there's something I'm supposed to do later today or tomorrow or next week, then by writing it down, I'll remember to put that into my getting things done system so that I will actually do it. Or maybe I'll figure out somebody else who can do it, whatever it takes. But perhaps more importantly than that, yes, it's important when these things come up to write them down so that I will remember to do them. But what it also allows me to do is to put that thing out of my head for now. Uh, if I'm working, say, using Pomodoro technique or the monotasking approach, where I spend 30 minutes of uninterrupted focus time working on a single task, then when something pops into my head, I can write it down, and then I can put it out of my head, not think about it, and it will not distract me. I can now focus my attention back on the task that I was working on. And when my 30-minute time window is up, then I can spend a few minutes taking a break, taking a sip of tea, taking a sip of coffee, and then looking down at my list and asking, of the stuff that I wrote down, is there anything that I need to do now? Because then I can switch, finish that up in 30 minutes, and get back to what I was working on. Or maybe uh, that just gives me an opportunity to remember, OK, I need to put that in my inbox so that I can deal with it later. And again, it's out of my head, and I can relax and focus. So to finish. Uh, there are some other things that I'd like to talk about but won't have time. What I'd like to do instead is to leave you for now with the idea that I think one of the things that runs through all these ideas is the notion of managing your energy by reducing stress so that you overall build your capacity to do more work, to learn more things, to learn more technical skills, to do those things more effectively. Uh, for programmers especially, but I think for anyone in general, if you learn to manage your energy better, to have more energy to bring to your work, more focus, then you'll find that everything goes much more smoothly. And then learning the technical skills, TDD, deliberate discovery, exploratory testing, whatever it is, will become that much easier, and you'll become that more effective at it. Thanks very much for your time. And now, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, JB. She was a new voice uh, last year at the Agile Testing Days, and this year she's going to be a keynote speaker, and I'm happy that she's going to join me uh, next Monday. Ash Coleman will provide uh, some clarity to the testers pro uh, process, and I am looking forward to her talk, and I hope that you will join me as well. Thank you again, JB, for your Thank talk you for and for uh, sharing your time with me and all the others. 
and I hope to see you soon. All right. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.